the invisible world. It's out there. You can go on the internet, you can watch television, and they'll talk about the paranormal world. They'll speak about instances where people encounter ghosts in houses. And there are those who actually go looking for these ghosts and in some instances finding them. Because there are haunted houses after all, but the people who go looking for these spirits have no idea the kind of spirit they're looking for and even if they find them, they have no idea regarding their origin or their intention or what they are up to. What a world we live in, people interested in the unseen, the normally unseen, and they're doing what they can to interpret it. How different it is when we open the pages of the Bible. Because there we discover that in addition to God, who is of course unseen, there are only two kinds of spirits in the world. There are angels and there are demons, and if our eyes were open to the spirit world, I think that we would be surprised at the amount of activity around us that is taking place all the time. There's a veritable buzz, so to speak, in the spirit world. And there are, yes, only angels and demons, and today we're going to speak about angels because a couple of messages back I spoke about the occult and we spoke about the demons and Satan. Today we speak about angels. And there is in America an angel craze. There are some places where you can go to an angel store devoted to trinkets and paraphernalia that has to do with angels. And people, again, don't understand the distinctions that happen. We had a television show on uh, angels and uh, how the angels are able to bless people and to help people. And right now, I'm checking my notes to see what that television program was. Yes, touched by an angel. It was that good feeling program that was family oriented that all kinds of stories of people in distress and someone comes to deliver them. What many don't realize is that that particular series was loaded with cultural theology that is unbiblical and wrong. For example, the idea was that there are angels floating around wanting to do nice things for almost anyone, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you believe, they will show up and they will do it. And people didn't understand that there are two different kinds of angels in the atmosphere, and there are those that are evil angels, but they will be turned into angels of light and do you good if they can deceive you and make sure that you're not afraid to die. They're willing to help along the road of life. Well, today, a few facts about angels before we get to a, an amazing story in the Bible. A couple of things about angels. First of all, they were created by God. Psalm 145 lists the moon and the sun and the angels, and it says, at thy command they were created. I love that. At thy command they were created. God spoke, and boom, they were there. And they were there by the multiplied millions at his word. Created by God because there are no baby angels. Jesus made this very clear. They do not procreate. They don't multiply like human beings. So they were individually created by God. They are persons. You see, the test for personality is intellect, emotion, and will. And angels have all of that very clearly. The fact that they are spirit beings doesn't mean that they don't have intelligence. Of course they do. Look at the Bible. Look at the messages they bring. Look at the fact that they want to look into the whole story of redemption. Clearly, they have intelligence. They have emotions. There are things that cause them joy. There are things that cause them sadness. And they have a will. After all, a third of them, according to Genesis, excuse me, Revelation chapter 12, a third of them fell with Lucifer. So they chose against God, the one third did. So they have wills. They are personalities. They are also all originally holy. Here's a verse I ought to preach on sometime. It says in Mark chapter 8 that when Jesus comes, those who are ashamed, Jesus said, of me and my words, 
in this adulterous generation, of that person I shall be ashamed when I come with my Father's glory with the holy angels. You know, and there are some people who think that the return of Jesus is going to be a happy experience for everyone. Well, Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. Think about that for a moment. But when I come with the holy angels, originally all of them holy because they were created by God. And of course, they were all holy. And uh, they have rank and organization. You have Michael, for example, who is the chief angel, Michael the archangel. You know, when Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4 that when the Lord comes in the rapture, he shall come in the clouds and the voice of the archangel, he doesn't even have to name him because everybody knows, based on other passages of Scripture, that that's Michael who is going to be giving the charge. He is in charge of the host of angels. And then you have some angels like Gabriel, whose main responsibility is to communicate messages. According to the book of Daniel, there are also angels that are chief princes, which means that there are a whole category that have a great deal of influence and a great deal of relationship. And beyond that, you have principalities and powers, all organized very, very well, just like the demonic side of the spirit world is also well organized. And so that's what the Bible says about angels. And in Hebrews 1.14, it says that they are sent to be heir ministers to those who are heirs of salvation, namely believers. When you think of angels in relationship to the unconverted, read the book of Revelation, and there you see them heaping judgment on the world. You know, I was thinking about this. When John fell before an angel, remember this in the book of Revelation, the angel says, no, don't fall before me. Obviously, you don't, never want to worship an angel. He said, don't fall before me. And then the angel said, I am a fellow servant. Isn't that beautiful? Angels are fellow servants. They are there to help us and to minister to those who are heirs of salvation. And what that means will become a little clearer as this message proceeds. But now for the story. And you have to see this in your Bible so that you know that I'm not making this story up. This is 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. Now, just in case you left your Bible at home, I think it's on page 312. 312 in the Bibles that you have there in the seat in front of you. But 2 Kings chapter 6, let me just tell the whole story to you. And then what we're going to do is go back and we're going to try to grasp why this message and this story should be life transforming for all of us. And why we should leave studying God's word today differently than when we began. Because the power of the word to transform us is overwhelming. So with that background, uh, here's what happened. The king of Syria, and this is not modern Syria as such, but the king of Syria is warring with the king of Israel. And uh, the king of Syria says, you know, I'm going to bring my troops over here, and he's plotting that. And lo and behold, it's very clear that the king of Israel knows exactly what's going to happen. Because then he withdraws his troops from the area, he is ready for the attack, and this happens a couple of times, so the king of Syria is very distressed and believes that there's someone within his ranks who's a spy. But um, one of his servants, who clearly heard of the prophet Elisha, not Elijah, it's easy to get them confused because they were contemporaries, but I hope I remember today that it is Elisha. You'll notice he says in verse 12, one of his servants, that is the king of Syria's servants, said, No, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet, who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. <laughs> He's saying, your most private conversations are known to Elisha, who then goes and tells the king of Israel what you, the king of Syria, are going to do. Now, either... Elisha had some very big ears, or more probably, God was telling Elisha exactly what the king of Syria was saying. So the king of Syria says, okay, where's Elisha? They said, Dothan. By the way, I've been to Dothan many years ago. It's about 10 miles north of Samaria. But um, he says in verse 13, go and see where he is that I may send and seize him. 
it was told him, Behold, he's in Dothan. So he sent their horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city. I mean, you talk about overkill. I mean, you know, you want to get one guy. So you send horses and chariots and your big army. And, um, I mean, talk about shooting a roach with a shotgun. I think there's somebody who wants to write a country song, and if I remember, the title is, Get the Hammer, Mama, There's a Fly on Papa's Head. <laughs> and uh, this is a little bit of overkill, actually. Maybe you don't need exactly a hammer now, but nonetheless, the king says, we're going to get that guy. So he sends a whole army, the Bible says a vast army, of, of chariots and horses to capture Elisha. Well, what happens is this. Verse 15, when the servant of the man of God, this is the servant of Elisha now, when he arose in the early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Put yourself in the position, as I have, of being the servant. That's where we are. And remember the situation now. This would be like, as someone has said, it would be equivalent to you waking up and finding tanks all around your house. And when you look at the labels carefully, you realize that it says North Korea. And uh, you're going to have a very bad day. <laughs> very bad day. Well, Elisha is speaking to the servant, says, um, uh, he said in verse 16, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Let me ask you something. Would that have cut mustard with you? If you had been there, would you have said, Oh, that's enough for me, O oh man of God. <laughs> Let's just change the illustration a little bit. You're uh, driving along the street. It's midnight, and you've just driven over a series of sharp objects, all four uh, tires of your car are flat. You're surrounded by gang members. Some people have, some of them have a gun, some of them have knives, some of them have chunks of iron and stones, and they begin breaking the window. And you say to the person next to you, uh, do not be afraid. Behold, there are more with us than are with them. And the person says, why, of course, forgive me. <laughs> forgive me for my anxiety. Uh-uh, uh-uh. You need something more than just the word of a man of God at that moment. Elisha knew that. And here is a miracle that has occurred only here in the Bible, at least a miracle like this. Don't expect one like this for yourself, but there is a reason why it happened here so that we might learn. And uh, Elisha prayed and said in verse 17, O oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots and fire all around Elisha. Well, there's a spirit world out there, and notice it says that there was now a vast army. There are more who are with us than with them because there are myriads of angels. In fact, the Bible says 10,000 times 10,000. I haven't figured it out, but that clearly is in the multiplied millions. And, uh, and there are many of them, and, and this army is bigger. And let me say a word about angels. They are spirit beings, but sometimes God gives them the opportunity and the ability to actually become physical. That's why in the Old Testament there are those who entertained a angels unawares, as did Abraham. There are stories even today of where people have appeared out of nowhere to help someone, and when they turned around to thank them, uh, the person has disappeared. I know somebody to whom that happened, and I have every reason to believe, the possibility at least, that this was an angel sent by God in a time of distress. And even Satan, let's think theologically here for a moment, he must also have something like that ability because he did quote scripture, and a spirit couldn't quote scripture. He'd have to have some kind of a physical form to make sure that those little puffs of air, which is the way in which we communicate words, would be given to Jesus. And in this instance, God allowed these angels to somehow, whether literally or figuratively, 
take the form of angels that have chariots, the fire symbolic of God, and these beings are surrounding the town of Dothan, and there are, just like the man of God said, more of God's angels than there were members of the Syrian army. What a story, but let's continue it. And uh, later on, it says that Elisha said that the Lord opened his eyes, verse 18, and when the Syrians came down against him, Elijah prays now a different prayer and says, Lord, please strike this people with blindness. So God struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And I, Elisha says sarcastically, this is really funny. He says, um, this is not the way and this is not the city. Follow me and I'll bring you to the man whom you seek. <laughs> well, of course they're seeking him. He says, uh-uh, you don't really want me. You want uh, the king of Israel. Let me take you to uh, Samaria. Well, they're blind. What are they going to do? They're going to have to follow him. And so they go the 10 miles to Samaria and the king of Israel is elated and wants to kill them. I'll summarize the story, but Elisha says, no, no, don't kill them. Let's make a feast for them. Set bread and water before them, I'm in verse 22, that they may eat and then go to their master. So he prepared for them a great feast, and when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master, and the Syrians did not come again on raids into the land of Israel, at least for a time. Later on, they did again, but that staved off the invasion. What a story. What I'd like to do now is to give you four truths that I believe will be transforming for you tomorrow and in the days ahead. And whether you're here today as a student, whether you're here today as a businessman, no matter what your profession, as a housewife, I want to encourage you today and I want you to leave with a confidence that God is on your side. So here are the four transforming truths. Number one, important to realize is that God's word is more powerful than the armies of the world. God's word is more powerful than the armies of the world. By the way, what I wanted to do in the next few moments is to get you from verse 15 to verse 17. The real agenda that you and I have, how do we live in the world that you can see, which is a very real world, in such a way that we nonetheless derive our encouragement and our strength from the world that you can't see. That's where we are going in the next few moments. And, and so first of all, please notice carefully that God's word is more powerful than these armies. When God wants to defend Israel, God is able to intervene and he has multiple armies and various strategies at his disposal that he can deploy at any moment to defend his people whenever he wants to defend them. Because God is sovereign, and God is the one who rules in the affairs of men. The best way to illustrate this is Pilate. Imagine Pilate is standing in the presence of Jesus and he says, do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Boy, that sounds confident. Oh, imagine the words of Jesus. You know them by memory, don't you? Jesus looks at him and calmly said, Thou hast have no power at all against me unless it were given to thee from above. Wow, Pilate, don't you know that the air you breathe, don't you know that the brains that I gave you, don't you know that the position that you are now in is all because I have allowed it, it is under my hands. You can do nothing, absolutely nothing, unless I gave you the ability to do it. And when we look at what's happening in America, and when we think of the designs of radical Islam and the number of Christians that are being killed today simply because they are Christians, and uh, throughout the world, those kinds of persecutions and all that is going through, would we remember that God's word is more powerful than the armies and the designs of men who strut on the stage of history, believing themselves to be strong. But when God wants to defend his people, he has adequate resources to do it. And <laughs> 
and they can do nothing unless it is given to them from above. You need to hang on to that in a world that has lost its way. God is confidently in charge. There's a second lesson. The first is that God's word is more powerful than the armies of the world. Secondly, Elisha's prayer. Did you notice this? Elisha's prayer did not bring the angels. Elisha's prayer only opened the eyes of the servant to see angels that were already there. They already were in place, and Elisha knew it, whether he could see them or not at that point, I don't know. But Elisha was absolutely confident that in the midst of a situation where everyone was ganging up on him, where a whole army was sent to cut off his head, that he could stand there with utter confidence, believing without wavering that if God wanted to deliver him, he could, and also believing that at all times, when it comes to believers, there are more on our side than there are on the enemy's side because God has already won the victory. There was no use praying, oh God, send angels. No use praying, oh God, send angels. The angels were there, just open your eyes and see what God has already done. That is always my greatest need and that is your greatest need as well, always that we might be able to see what God has done. There are so many things we pray for that really God has already accomplished. Uh, for example, we say, Lord, defeat Satan. Well, Satan has been crushed and defeated. Now he's out on bond, I understand that, out on bail, and, and uh, he's doing a lot of damage. But when we confront him, our prayer should be one of thanksgiving. Oh God, I thank you for the defeat of Satan. I thank you that that has already been accomplished. And I stand now on what you've done rather than asking you to do something more except to apply what you've done to my situation because God is God and he is totally sovereign over your situation. And you know, we pray, oh God bless us. And it's okay to pray that way. I, uh, I'm sure that I pray that way many times for a specific situation. But how about this verse in Ephesians? He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. How about a prayer that says, Lord, you've blessed me with all spiritual blessings. Help me to know what they are and how they can be applied to my life. It's already done. The blessing has already been given in Jesus. So Elisha's prayer didn't bring the angels. It only revealed them. There's another lesson, and that is that uh, only God, only God can open people's eyes and also blind them. You'll notice that the text says very clearly here, and the Lord opened the servant's eyes. Who else could do that? Could Elijah do that and say, well, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like you to be able to peer into the Spirit's world. Here's some eye drops that'll help you to do that. Uh-uh. The Spirit's world is ultimately God's domain, even though you have angels and demons interfacing all the time in that Spirit world. The fact is that only God can open our eyes to see spiritual truth. I don't expect ever to see angels the way in which um, Elisha and the servants saw them. But the Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 1. This is why Paul says, and this is the way we ought to pray for one another. You know, sometimes we say, well, I don't know how to pray for these missionaries. What are their needs? You always know the need of the missionaries. Missionaries you've never met, missionaries in countries whose name you cannot pronounce, you know in advance what their need is because it's mentioned there in the book of Ephesians chapter 1 about verse 19. It says, the eyes of your heart, I'm praying that they might be enlightened, that you might know the hope of your calling and God's inheritance in the saints, and then he goes on to talk about the sovereignty of Jesus who is above every principality and every power and every name that is named. And if you don't know how to pray for a missionary, you pray that prayer because my greatest need and your greatest need is always to see the triumph of Jesus and to have the eyes of our hearts open so that we can grasp it. Apart from the power of the Spirit, we can't. We can't. 
And the Bible says this regarding faith. Faith is the assurance. This is, of course, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Let's take this slowly. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things unseen. We are, after all, in a series of messages on the unseen world. Faith is a conviction of things unseen based on the promises of God, based on the teaching of God through his word. And so the way in which we encounter the world is to know that that spirit world, if we are believers, is on our side in the sense that God is on our side and nothing is happening without his permission. Satan cannot wiggle unless God says, okay, I'm giving you permission to wiggle. And so as a result of that, faith is built into our hearts. The eyes of our hearts being enlightened that we might know the hope of our calling. How do you know when this has happened to somebody? What's a practical test on whether or not somebody really gets it or doesn't get it? The way you find out is uh, listen to them pray. And uh, if their prayer is just begging, 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 they don't get it. If their prayer is, oh God, uh, these are my needs, and you know, we explain it all to God, and we say, did you get it, God, you know, and do I have to go over this again for you, maybe tomorrow? You know, that's the way we sometimes come to God, as if we're talking to an uncle who just doesn't understand that we need money. And uh, so we explain it to God over and over again. Well, we don't have to do that. But here's the test. Are you just simply asking God or are you thanking God? If you begin to thank God, after all, if God be for us, who can be against us? If you begin to thank God for situations even that are distressful, if you begin to thank God for battles that are taking place in your soul because you see the greater glory that comes to God when those battles are won, even as we heard in this marvelous testimony this morning, when you begin to live that way, then you begin to realize that God is in control and your eyes are hope opened. And as for the Syrians, God blinded them. And then when they got to Samaria, God opened their eyes. What a miracle that was. And they discovered that there they are in Samaria, right where the king is, the king that they were not looking for, namely the king of Israel. Finally, it's not necessary. It's not necessary for us to see angels in order to appreciate them. It's not necessary for us to see angels in order to appreciate them. Let me ask you a question. What would have happened if uh, the servant had not uh, had his eyes opened? Would the horses and chariots of fire have been around the mountain anyway? Of course. We don't see angels. To my way of thinking, I don't think that I have ever seen one, though I live with somebody who comes close to that. <laughs> Uh, I'll just let that remark float out there, and you can do with it whatever you want. But we don't see angels. In fact, here's the interesting thing. Look at the text. God never even used these chariots of fire. They were just on call in case he needed them. I don't see any... any uh, any uh, work here on the part of the chariots of fire, the army comes towards Elisha and he says, God blind them, and God blinded them. He prayed to the Lord. Obviously, he didn't pray to the angels. Don't ever do that. But he prays to the Lord and uh, he uh, blinds them. God blinds them. And that's the way the victory was won. And all right, angels, you can all go home now. Uh, the matter has been taken care of. I believe that God always has angels on call because they love to serve, not because he actually needs them, but they love to be used. And sometimes he um, doesn't use them when it may appear as if it's rational to do so. Here's Jesus being carried away, and what does he say? Uh, you know, Peter is taking out his sword and uh, slapping the high priest and cutting off his ear, and Jesus said, could I not have called Ten legions of angels to deliver me. Wow. 
I forget how many ten legions are, but it's plenty. And I see these angels just hovering over Jesus and saying, just give us the command and we'll take care of everybody who's crucifying you and everybody who's ever hated you. We'll just get rid of them, zap. But Jesus said, I could call you, but I'm not. I'm glad they're there. And sometimes God does not allow angels to protect us. You know that uh, there are times when, uh, yeah, and there are, I believe, guardian angels based on Matthew 18, at least for children. Sometimes God does not have those angels protect the children. And we've had some terrible examples in the news recently where that has happened. But they're on call. The angels are on call. But God has different purposes, and so he may not use them. And even here, the chariots of fire were more for the servant than they were because God decided to use the angels in a victory, though sometimes he does. Now, the Bible says that the angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. How do they minister to us, and how do we appreciate them even if we don't see them? First of all, they rejoice when you were converted. Jesus said in Luke chapter 15, he says, if a woman is looking for a coin and can't find it, and then she rejoices when the coin is found. A little personal word here. On uh, Friday, I made the notes for this message, and then I finished them yesterday morning, and suddenly the notes disappeared. I mean, I looked everywhere. Rebecca was beginning to help me look for these notes, must have spent a half. And there they were. They were on my desk just moments ago. That was the, that was the unbelievable thing. I had just finished them. What happened to them? Have you ever had the experience of losing something and you look in a hundred places where it could never possibly be? That was me looking for these notes yesterday. I didn't want to redo these notes, and I didn't have to. They were actually interspersed with some other sermon notes. So I'm glad I eventually found them. But here's the point that Jesus is making. He's saying, if a woman with a coin rejoices when the coin is found, if indeed somebody rejoices because some pieces of paper were found, how much more will the angels in heaven rejoice when a soul repents? Could I ask you a question? Have you caused the angels in heaven to rejoice? Was there a cosmic celebration in heaven because you came to saving faith in Christ and you believed on him and all of heaven said, wow, another believer, praise God. Yeah, that's what happens at your conversion. Then, of course, they protect us during our lifetime. I already mentioned sometimes that is not an absolute kind of protection. It's all governed by God. And then they welcome us into heaven. You know, the Bible says in Luke chapter 16 where you have the rich man who dies and he goes into Hades, and then you have this Lazarus who's the poor beggar, and the big contrast there is, here's a man with the money, and he is lost, and here's someone who begs at his table and eats with the dogs under the table. And lo and behold, because of his faith in Jesus Christ and in Jehovah, he gets to go to Abraham's bosom, and it says, angels carried him into Abraham's bosom. As you probably know, I have never died. But I suspect that when I do and when you do and when my parents did, yes, they would see Jesus in a moment of time, but even before that, there may be angels that carry them to where Jesus is. Those angels don't ever worship them. But you know, I have to say this. I admire those angels for this reason. The Bible says when it comes to salvation, it says in 1 Peter, it says that regarding salvation in the time of Jesus Christ's coming, these were things that the angels desire to look into. They are so enamored with our redemption. And catch this, they don't have one ounce of jealousy, even though someday we're going to be elevated above them. No question about it. We will be above the angels. 
And the reason is angels can serve God and they can do these wonderful things, but one thing an angel can never do is to be a brother of Jesus. And the Bible says that because we are brothers of Jesus, we become heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Whatever Jesus inherits, the Bible says we'll inherit because of him. And the angels know that and still love us and still rejoice in our redemption. Not an ounce of envy in these marvelous beings that God has created. Well, the question is, how do we prepare for the unseen world? Well, we've already hinted at it, and that is this, that the unseen world, the Bible says, is eternal. The seen world is temporal. Everything is going to be burned up, the Bible says. All of our sermon notes are going to be burned up, possibly before the end of time, might I say. <laughs> Everything we've ever created, it's all going to be burned up. What manner of people ought we to be? Well, the answer, of course, is this that it's through faith in Jesus Christ and trusting him as our Savior and receiving his grace and his love. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. No man comes into that unseen world prepared for heaven apart from me. So where is your soul today? Have you trusted Christ as Savior or are you kind of trusting the fact that you're a nice person? That might make you a good neighbor but it'll never take you to heaven. Jesus is the way, the only way I urge you to believe on him and be saved. And let's remember, we can draw strength from the invisible world, the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son, while we live in a very visible, confusing world. Would you join me as we pray? And if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, even while I'm praying, why don't you reach up to him and say, Jesus, today I believe on you. I want to cause the angels in heaven to have a celebration because I receive him as mine. Father, help us to be encouraged when we realize that we have more on our side than others do on theirs. And even though we may experience death and destruction and health issues and financial issues, at the end of the day, you are ready with so many options to help us. And you do help your people. Give us confidence today, O oh God, we ask, and build our faith. Show us our inheritance that we might give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You're watching Pastor Lutzer on Moody Church Media. If you enjoyed this and would like to hear additional teaching from God's Word, please subscribe to this channel or visit our website at moodymedia.org. May God bless you richly.